Our keynote speaker for this session is Dr. Louise Corovo from the Geological Survey of Canada. So we're very proud to introduce Louise, a research scientist. Louise is a very well respected Canadian geoscientist with extensive experience mapping regions such as the Grenville Province in eastern Canada and the Great Bear Province in the Northwest Territories. Louise is also an associate professor at the National Institute for Scientific Research in Quebec and was associate editor for the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences for over eight years. We're very happy that she's come all the way from beautiful Quebec to join us for Discovery Day this week and also at next week's IOCG conference to share her insights from her extensive experience and with mapping alteration systems related to IOCG deposits. So I'd like to welcome Louise to the stage. Thank you very much. Oh well, maybe I'll try to behave for once. Well, I would like uh, to thank the Geological Survey of South Australia for inviting me to present our collaborative research uh, on alteration phases in our CG terrains, a global view. And this title really comes from Adrian. And to me, our CG terrains was such a weird concept that I thought, okay, why would somebody consider the Olympic Copper Gold province and OCG terrains. Well, because you've been so successful at finding OCGs. However, from my point of view, when I map those systems, then the OCGs are just a small part of a large mineral systems uh, that will have OCG, but also affiliated deposits or affiliated mineralization type. What I'm going to show you today is that those alterate, those <laughs> alteration systems have a very rigorous sequence of evolution and that each alteration phase leads to its own deposit types or serve as ground preparation for some other deposit types. There will be disruption in all those systems due to tectonic activities that can bring lower temperature fluids into the fluid plumes and uh, magmatism that will start heating up the fluid plumes and then again change a little bit the regular sequence. But once you understand globally how the regular sequence works, then you can really work at the regional scale to the deposit scale to understand your deposits. There will be a spectrum of metal in, within those various deposits including critical commodities. And I think that's very important for our governments to be able to tap on those critical commodities very efficiently. And then I'll show that the alteration phases are metal pathways to ore. And in fact, I should say the alteration phases are metal pathways to the mineralization types. One of the weakness of what I'm going to pre present is I can bring you to mineralization. I can explain all the various types of mineralization. I don't know where all will be. What will be the metal contents? That's still something for the younger generation to work on. We have to leave the stuff for you to work on. So. And also, I'll show you that the alteration themselves are mappable criteria for mineral potential assessment. And I hope that what you gain from this, uh, this presentation is that we are at a turning point now where we can go back in the field, map our alteration, see all sorts of things that the previous generation was not trained or didn't have the knowledge to find. So really mapping <coughs> is key to understanding those systems nowadays. But when you don't have a lot of outcrops, you may do with what you have. But we've developed all sorts of other tools that transfer what we saw in the field into geochemical database, into rock physical properties. What I will use is the extremely well exposed area uh, outcrop of the Great Bear Magnetic Zone. And I'm going to cheat a little bit and use some of the Romane Horse, Eastern Granville Province, with its heavy railroad. Uh, our deposit, real heavy rare earth, our deposits, central mineral belt with albito, albitos to uranium, and those ones have a lot of albitos to gold, cobalt mineralization. 
So not only is the great biomagnetic zone well exposed, but it's very kindly was tip over through large scale folding. So you could go from the bottom of the mineral system to the top, you tip it, and you just have to walk it. Now, it's also laterally very extensive, so you can just walk it as well. Other mineral system very kindly stayed upright, but part of the deep part were trusted upward as the fluid plume was going up and then start making different deposit types while in this area some deposits were being made. So you could juxtapose deposit types through understanding the alteration species. The rocks are extremely well preserved. We have a sedimentary basin that was considered highly metamorphosed because people mix in metasomatic rocks with metamorphic rocks. So now we know that it's very, quite weakly metamorphosed. Overlying that is a big volcanic center, but really the early ones, those that host the mineral systems, form small systems that are distributed ag across the great bare magmatic zones. After that, you form the mineral system, you have your subvolcanic intrusion, you have your fluid plumes that comes in, you have caldera collapse, the summital part of the systems form uh, class in conglomerate within the cauldron, and then you have an outpouring of inning drives, big granodiorite batholiths being in place, and then your late stage A-type plutons granites. So really, same thing as what you have here in South Australia. The beauty of it is we have outcrops. And after that, <laughs> OK, sorry. I was supposed to behave. I feel miserable. Um, after that, after the mineral systems, you also have big dark swamps that are not altered, they are not metamorphosed. So you know that everything has been frozen in. So what you see is what the system has done. We'll stop walking the system from bottom to top. First thing is we will form albitites. I'm not talking about albitization. I'm talking about albitites. Any host rock will be transformed into albitite. The albitite will be followed for one, two, three, ten kilometers. Some of them will love to be cuddled around some volcanic intrusion and others will love to go into uh, along foul zones. So you form your albitite, and any host rock get transformed into albitites. Whether you have basalt, whether you have intrusion, whether you have silstone, whether you have andesite rhyolite, or anything, it gets transformed into albitite. The next thing, if you, if you are along foul zone, then the albitites, which are very porous, will get brecciated. Now, if in <coughs> contrast, if you were above subvolcanic intrusion, then they would remain largely massive unless they were there and trained by fall zone and brecciated. Perfect ground preparation for what is to come next. Now, in simple system, you just go up. The next stage will be a sodic, calcic, iron alteration species that has a wide variety of alteration, uh, minerals, albite, amphibole, magnetite, apatite, in all sorts of different contents. But if you have strata bond alteration of amphibole, next door you'll have halos of albitite. So that's how we define those alteration species. You can have veins. Let's take these veins here, amphibole, Arrows of albite. So the face sheet is the, uh, the combination of the amphibole and the albite. And why do we bother making face sheets? <coughs> is that those rocks are a mess. But if you regroup all your minerals, minerals into their dynastic alteration face sheets, which means that you have very similar physical com chemical conditions of precipitation for each of the facies. The sum of the facies forms your systems, 
Metamorphic Petrology 101. So we, we get into a very coherent framework to understand any ultra, including your Alec, Alec Wynn quark. And in here, this is an design, and those were sedimentary rocks. So if you want to find your host rocks when you're mapping your systems, good luck. <laughs> I don't bother often. <laughs> now, the next species that you have, if you have carbonate rocks, then the carbonates will get transformed into scones. Now the fluid plume is coming up. It's hot, well, hotter than normal system, so between six, around 600, and it's going to, uh, to form 350, it's going to transform all your carbonates into scones. The scones now have become a classic, uh, a silicic rock, so it's going to behave like any other host rock. If your system is big, your scones will be altered to the next species. The magnesium will disappear. The clinoparxin will disappear. Those rocks are very unstable like any other host rock. So what is important here is to never, ever, ever stop calling a rock that has amphibole and magnetite and label that as scones. Please don't ever, ever do that. Because then you're mixing apple and oranges. You are confusing the issue. Because there is a very systematic evolution, and if we start calling everything scones, then we lose all that information. So let's keep scones and those systems to clinoparoxin and garnet rocks. Because when the amphibol comes in, it's not just a rich isochemical retrogression of an earlier scum. No, no, you're totally changing the composition of your rock <coughs> dramatically. So, and you don't need a causative intrusion to make your scars because simply the fluid plume is so hot that it does the job. So if you don't have an intrusion next to pontil, you don't need it. You just <coughs> don't need it. So, field work. What will it look like? We have here early stratabond albi, followed by stratabond amphibol. In the same outcrop, we have shear zone filled in with magnetite. Here, the same outcrop, all the magnetite is going stratabond, but have a look at it. The fluid, the fluid has moved in and then dies there. This is not an iron formation. So any of your iron formation has to be reviewed because all of those in the Great Bear magnetic zone were magnetite alteration of sedimentary <coughs> layering. The next thing you can have in a volcanic rocks is perfect preservation of your albitized filocrist and the matrix gets altered to magnetite. And I can tell you that magnetite can do exactly the same thing and cross will replace the phenocrist and magnetite uh, and emetite the matrix. So a lot can happen in those systems and having a good understanding of metastasism is key. The other thing is when you arrive at the high temperature calcium iron species, the temperature is very hot. If magma comes in, warms up your fluid plume, when it's stable is amphibole magnetite. You know, amphibole species rocks type conditions. So what does that mean? It means you can deform your rocks as your fluid plume is advancing if you have tectonic activity. So if you have a fold, sorry, if you have a fold, please do not call up upon a, a, an orogenesis. All it's telling you is that during that metasomatism, you add tectonic activity. And that's good because you want more magma, you want more fluids coming in into your system. It's great, but this is not an orogenesis. And at the extreme, what are those high temperature calcium iron fish is going to do? 
they are going to develop aronoxide apatite deposits. And those aronoxide apatite deposits, if they are in a system that can evolve to the next species, which will have potassium, then these aronoxide apatite deposits will have rarots, heavy rarots. That's the Joseph deposits that focus graphite and soquim have in Quebec. Now, when you're mapping your rocks, your breccia, and you see polymixic breccia, always remember that some alteration loves class. So if you have a beautifully magnetite altered class in here, do not jump to the conclusion that this was a, a magnetite rich rocks that have been brecciated. It's wrong. If you have a K-Fels power one, and I don't have one in this uh, picture, it may be very wrong as well. Quite often, magnetite in particular, k power in particular, loves to go and selectively replace class in breccia. So it's very important to know that you have to notice that in here, all in here, all in there, you have the magnetite coming in, and then it's just coming in, it's just coming in, and you have same thing here, and whoops, alter the class, whoops, alter the class. It does a beautiful job at purposely altering the class. The next phase is we will have. Now our fluid plume is coming up, and it's encountering sedimentary rocks. In those cases, you're going to develop quite often the, a transient species which will have calcium, potassium, iron minerals. So amphibole pyrotite, magnetite, k phosphor in all sorts of proportion. And it will start crystallizing cobalt. Cobalt, bismuth, gold, tungsten. And you will have your cobalt sulfides. Now if you drill that to find copper, but you're losing your time. Copper is waiting. It's in the fluid. It's not precipitating yet. Copper will be starting to precipitate as a potassium iron alteration. If you are in the sedimentary rocks, it might be magnetite biotite. If you are in the volcanic rocks, it's going to be magnetite K-phosphor. Now, what is? The phages, the phages is the k part class plus the aronoxide matrix. Because the k part needs the aluminum substratum, substratum to crystallize. No aluminum, no, no k part. So don't ask your k part to be in the matrix. It's not stable there. It needs the aluminum. So your phages is the combined k part alteration of the class and the aronoxide. Matrix and of course the calcium chloride that precipitates. Now, when you want that ground, believe me, it's beautiful. <laughs> you are in your nanotype and high temperature calcium iron, and then suddenly, you know, things are fairly quiet, and suddenly, poof, it explodes. As soon as you have a lot of k part with magnetite, brecciation is taking place. You don't need to be in a fall zone. Of course, if you have a bit of tectonic activity, that will help. But you don't need a, to be right in a fall zone for the whole thing to just blow. So it's pretty. I like that. And if you want to impress an exploration geologist who has just come with you, you just break the rock and you tell her, no. Because we are under high temperature KFP and it has brecciated and it's full of magnetite and KFP and it's intense, we'll have calcopyrite. You break her up and you gave her the calcopyrite during sample. Very nice. Very fun. <laughs> Next thing. Well, sometimes that fluid plume, after being hot and rising and warming up the country rocks, sometimes it thinks that its skin cooled down. And it starts saying, oh, I can crystallize some, uh, some carbonate. Oh, let's crystallize some carbonate. It's cool. No, it's nice. And then suddenly, the real fluid plume is coming up. 
and then say, talk of a nation. You're out of your stability field. Now you're going back to a scar. Or if you have a carbonate and you're all struck as you're growing up, the poor carbonate is just gone, transformed into a scar. But this is not the scar of the early one because we are the metatite to emetite transition. So then we get a potassic scar. And, and the potassium, of course, still needs the aluminum, so it will go and wiggle its way from class to class and just go and after the rocks at the same time as the matrix is precipitating skull, not slightly after. And you see how it goes, goes. This fragment is just, still has a bit of alphabetization at its core, but it's getting mostly Kiefer's part of third. This one is all gone to Kiefer's part. This one is all gone to Kiefer's part. Early on, some of the class were altered to Canopoxin and Epidem. So this fragment here is just earlier alteration, and all the Kiefer's part class is just coeval alteration. And after that, you get to the low temperature potassium iron alteration. And I love the slide of Kathy because she has, you know, the K fast part, the K fast part envelope plus the emetite envelope gives you copper and uranium. Of course, that's the large scale because in, in real life, those systems, they get intensified. And what does the iron oxide do? It's not a very friendly. Uh, minerals for potassium. You just get more and more the potassium out. You just push it, push it, push it. The k part is not stable. It doesn't have aluminum. The whole thing is getting rid of everything but it's emetite. So of course, all your copper, your gold, your bismuth, your cobalt will start continue to evolve. But at least globally, we already really see that as soon as we have the k part and emetite, we start Copper. And then if we have the albitite that was totally barren, that is get brought up into the field of potassium carbon alteration, then we can start to add in uranium. However, uranium can precipitate in so many facies due to overprints that when you work in those systems, you always have to be extremely careful to have your scintillometer or gamma ray spectrometer or other means and always know how much uranium you're dealing with. It doesn't stop you from doing the geology, but it just forces you to be a bit more sometimes more careful about your sampling strategies and things like that. All that time, we have not precipitate quartz. Quartz just comes at the end. <coughs> it can come with hematite. We see that at Olympic Dam, we see that in the Great Bear, but most of it will love to go into epitome of cap or vein type mineralization. Same thing for carbonates, the CO2. The CO2 that we have, you know, we, we transform our carbonates into scars and then after all the other alteration species, that CO2 is in the fluid plume. When the fluid plumes are we're getting at low temperature, it's getting rid of all its CO2. So that means siderite, that means carbon. So the simple analogy is a chain reaction. As soon as you have those high volume hypersaline saline <coughs> fluids that comes in, somewhere in the middle of the crust, it just flows out, and the upper crust has just lost control of its life. And you use a metamorphic petrology, petrology approach of mineral stability and mineral instability, and you work things out. But the same way as your minerals are changing in proportion and in type, hence in composition, your whole lot of chemistry is changing. So the best way to portray that and reprocess all of corporate database is to use molar proportion of bulk proc analysis. Sodium, calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium will give you a good idea of what's going on in your systems. It will help you to those uh, identify of these systems. 
And if you were to replace magnesium by silica plus aluminium divided by 10, it will distinguish your mineral system with OCG from SEDEX, VMS, epitomal, porphyry. So you just use a molar proportion in all your copper database across the world and you have a map of all criteria for mineral pers perspectivity. You, we think sedimentary rocks, our rhyolite is so different from a, a basalt, huh, nothing. This is your Shoshanitic calcaline and shale distribution of those elements. Well, let's have fun and let's look at our systems. Those systems totally transform rocks that have three to four dominant cations into rocks that have one to three dominant cations. When I say that the sodium leaches everything, it leaches everything. And then, as it goes up, it's starting to go and change composition at each phase sheet. But the same way as the cations are decoupled, your metals are just doing the same thing. They are just like taking part in that metamorphic petrology rules. I mean, you're changing composition of your cation, you're changing the composition of your metals, which you're changing your deposit types. So leaching, ground preparation, bad. Your scars are on lensing, nothing new. Then they are on oxide of a type, deposit, they'll have magnetite at first, they can have magnesium enrichment, they can have thorium, they can have tungsten enrichment, but for the rarest to appear, we have to wait a bit. Some don't seem to have potassium in the systems, so it stops there. Others have potassium, and then they will precipitate heavy layers. Next thing is the cobalt sulfide, with the bismuth, nickel, gold, copper sulfide with copper, silver, gold, etc. Then your potassium scars, they'll be polymetallic, they'll have copper and lead zinc. Your OCGs, that uh, emetal group you're very familiar with, I have nothing to teach you yet. And the, then your epitomal. I now have something to teach you. Because if you have to the west of the Olympic copper gold province of epitomal, please don't think that it's just for free. Epitomal caps are also offering above OCG deposits and those mineral systems. So, so that's very important. And after that, you can put all your deposit types for each alteration species. You can take your albitite, move it in the fields in the upwards, and then you'll have albitite also uranium or gold, etc. So everything works very nicely. And then you have to ask yourself, is the gallery fatal in our CG terrain? Or have you just used exploration strategies that allow uh, for the discovery of mostly our CGs? Which is not a bad problem. <laughs> I envy you. <laughs> so, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Two minutes? Okay. So we'll go real quickly here. And it's just like, just have a look at how things evolve each time. So we go, you know, we're from our IOA, IOA with rarits. Then if we want rare deposits, though, we need to concentrate those rarits. So we need late stage fluid, or we need organisms or magnetism. <coughs> now, same thing with gold cobalt bismuth. Then we'll play yo-yo here. We want a lot of this thing is not working anymore, okay. So it plays yo-yo, and you make your gold cobalt bismuth uh, deposits. And above it, then you'll have your ROC juice. Now, you're in the Concord district, have nothing to teach you. You have all your regional alteration species. You play yo-yo at the high temperature of potassium iron between baritite mag and Kekas palm mag, and then, it evolves, this one dies quickly with the carbonates 
uh, uh, and the magnetite. But if it didn't die, you could have your OCGs if there was more, maybe low temperature fluids and all sorts of things. You can also form potassium scum right at the magnetite hematite transition. The same thing, uh, some will have very little iron oxide, farm hill, some will have a lot of iron oxide, hillside. And then you can take things up, telescope them, and have the only type listed. And you can now add orogenesis to all that, or late stage fluids, or magnetism, you remolabilize everything. You always have to think, yeah, you just blew on those two solutions. If you say, yeah, I'm, this is a equilibrium, oh, I have to move. So you're making veins of all sorts of things. You're removing and moving things a bit each time. So any a mythic dikes, oh, remobilization. A neutral mythic rocks, oops, remobilization. A felsic dikes, oh, remobilization. A, a fall zone with your fluids, oops, remobilization. And orogenesis, whoops, or, uh, uh, remobilization. So when you have an orogenic gold in albitite or sudurium, think about me. I'm having fun. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, think about me. Five elements, veins, think about me. <laughs> so, corporate de database, we invented the barcodes, the box plot, and then we, we had, sorry, because that doesn't work anymore. So. so if you look up, we will go from lower left to the sodium, High temperature calcium iron, you move up to the high temperature potassium iron, you move further up, like the potassium gets, the system gets rid of the potassium, so it makes K plus form fill size, it makes phyllic alteration or hydrogenic alteration or advanced organic alteration or cystic alteration. <coughs> but then your old systems now is moving to, uh, high, uh, to low temperature potassium iron, so then you have to <coughs> for some analysis. And she kind of did that for you. And then you can form all the uh, low temperature evolution of your system. And that gives you a full spectrum of what those uh, systems will look like. And then you can plot that on your drill colleague. You can plot that on your mass for mineral prospectivity. And you can understand your rock physical property a lot better for understanding your alteration patient. The only thing I want to finish with is, you've got the systems. Now, conceptually metamorphose it to amphibolite patients and grand like patients. Yes. Because maybe we have discovered a lot of what had to be discovered at the surface in the type of deposit that we have been good in the 20th century. And now we have to drill deeper to find those. But now you take all those deposit types, you metamorphose them to granite fishes, you get rid of the old uh, wrong paradigm that says that upper level deposits will be eroded in high grade metamorphic terrain. Wrong. Each time somebody say that, please think about me. This is wrong. We're just totally incompetent at finding those deposits and totally incompetent at finding the volcanic rocks. It has nothing to do with a boring billion. It has all to do with our incompetency, global one. So if you want to find your volcanic rocks in those surveys, start with the hydrothermal alteration zones. They will have removed some of the key ingredients for melting. And you will find your volcanic rocks beautifully. So think about that. All exposed high-grade metamorphic terrains have to be explored. And to do that, we have to take all of the deposit types, use the geochemistry, conceptually metamorphose <laughs> all that, and then have a good feeling for what will be the rock type. Garnet, garnetite are not necessarily exilite. Garnet is to be expected from any OCGs. 
because you change the oxidation state. So your Kf here will give you, so if on the AFM diagrams, use that, then you can say, okay, gamma plus bartite, uh, uh, no, magnetite plus bartite is going to give me gamma plus bartite plus cosite, and start playing with that. So, because all our metamorphosis terrains now need to be explored. And I would like to say again thank you to everyone for inviting me here.